Welcome to Fabric Spotlight, a series of talks where we discuss infrastructure issues with uh, entrepreneurs in the cloud and IoT infrastructure space about technology and entrepreneurship. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to talk with you, uh, Yogesh Agarwal, VP of Data Center Business at NVIDIA. Welcome and thank you, Yogesh. Thank you, Prabhakar. Yeah, um, as a first thing, uh, maybe you can kind of like uh, orient the audience in terms of uh, how you got here, what your uh, journey has been uh, coming sure, to this sure. uh, position at NVIDIA. Yeah, so I really started my journey at Silicon Graphics where I was a compiler engineer. Ah, but at some pirates. point, uh, I felt there was a business side that I needed to go explore. So I quit to go get my MBA from Kellogg. Ah, okay. And while at Kellogg, I actually started a company with some friends. Uh, it was focused on looking at satellite images and figuring out how vegetation is changing on Earth and how to even forecast crops. What was the name of the company? Uh, it was called Forest One. Oh, okay. Yeah, we sold it to Thomson Reuters later I see, on. I see, okay. But the majority of my experience actually comes from Veritas and Symantec, uh -huh. where I uh, held a variety of roles in business development, product management, general management, across our software portfolio. I then was at EMC, where I led the management software group for their high-end storage division. Okay. And I was also at HP where I led their strategy and solutions uh, mm -hmm. for their storage group. So as you can tell, I've spent a lot of time in right, storage. Right. And I felt it was time to do something different. Mm -hmm. And that's what brought me to NVIDIA because uh, here I get to see how customers are using AI in various industries in order to transform their business. So it's interesting for me to do something different in the AI space now. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So uh, from that perspective, you are involved in that AI business. Uh, um, what is uh, the strategy the company is taking towards uh, these kind of these areas yeah. that you are involved in? There are three. There are three aspects of Nvidia's data center strategy that I would like to highlight. Uh, the first aspect is we are actually going after a very big market. Mm. The TAM for our market is about $50 billion by 2023. Oh, now okay. you will Just your market, that just, market. Just the data center market. Now you will wonder why is the TAM so big? Mm -hmm. The first reason is because Moore's law is dead, right? Mm. CPU scaling has reached its limits. Right. Now while that is happening, the market's demand for computing is only going up, That's true, right? Yeah. Particularly with things like AI. Mm -hmm. So the combination of Moore's law being dead and the market needing so much more computation power has put us in the middle of a perfect wave, mm. right? And so that's why we are doing amazingly well in our mm. data center business. The second thing from a strategy standpoint that I want to highlight, because I know it can be confusing to people, is that we are an accelerated computing platform company, mm. which is different from an accelerator. Mm. An accelerator accelerates a particular function, and you can use, a, use an ASIC or an FPGA to go do that. But when you talk about an accelerated computing platform, mm -hmm. you need a single architecture that can be applied to multiple different domains and accelerate that. Okay. It could be for a graphics domain, it could right. be for a high performance computing domain, it could be for a gaming domain, it mm -hmm. could be for an AI domain. And because we are able to do that in a single architecture, it opens up that big TAM for us that I referred mm -hmm. to earlier. Mm -hmm. The third thing that, again, from a strategy standpoint that I want to highlight is people may think of NVIDIA as just as a GPU company, but we actually go to market vertically in mm. every single industry, we very methodically try to understand what is the customer's use case, what are the applications, what is that ecosystem, and then we drive innovation from that application down, right? So if a particular application is important in an industry, then we build an entire software stack mm. to go accelerate that application, and the whole stack is what accelerates it. Oh, okay. So these are the three dimensions of our strategy. Number one, it's a big TAM. Number two, it's a platform with a right. single architecture for multiple domains. And the third thing is uh, the stack, it's the stack mm. which is very industry specific. So uh, that, that kind of like brings us to the next part of the discussion. So you mentioned that you are verticalized, industry specific, and you build the whole stack. The third part is uh, really very different from what you hear from some other yes. broad uh, infrastructure companies. 
so what are the segments that you are kind of like focused on and what is kind of like the stack elements of those? I mean, yeah, yeah. So you cannot be very broad, so you have to select yes, some. Yes, yes. So I'll, I'll focus more on AI as I answer this question, okay, right? So fine. really what you're asking is, where are we seeing AI adoption in what market segments Mar are we what seeing AI segments, adoption? Yeah, yeah. Right? So I think it's helpful to look at the waves of AI adoption as we have seen it. So the first wave for us from AI adoption standpoint was really the hyperscalers. Right? This is Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Tencent, Baidu, Alibaba's of the world. And they were using AI for speech, for computer vision, for recommendation engines. And we worked with them very closely mm -hmm. in that initial wave to make sure every single DL framework mm -hmm. gets accelerated. So that's an example of a market segment where the deep learning frameworks were important and we accelerated right. them. The second wave really is inside industries mm -hmm. where every single company in every industry is now saying AI can be transformative to my business. Mm -hmm. and, and how do I go do that? For example, in finance, a finance uh, bank would say, how do I use AI for fraud detection? Right. Or how do I uh, use AI for algorithmic trading if, if it's a hedge fund? Or they may try to understand the risk exposure. If you look at a telco, a telco does not want to just be a pipe provider anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So they would say, how can I use AI to automate my network operations? Or how Our can I... Subscriber intelligence. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, that's a very big use case. Or how mm -hmm. can I deliver more value-added services at the edge? So that's, that's what the second wave is industries, but I want to go a little deeper and maybe give you a perspective on the technologies involved, right? So the biggest place where we have seen adoption in industries is computer vision. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, uh, like, take smart cities as an example. We expect one billion cameras to get deployed for smart city deployments. Autonomous vehicle requires computer vision. In healthcare, if you think of a radiologist, they can use computer vision to do a more rapid diagnosis on, on an image. So computer vision is really where AI adoption to date in industries has been big. But the next big technology that is coming up is natural language processing. Mm, of course. Right? Or conversational AI, what right. we are doing here. Right. So this has been a big year for natural language processing where we are surpassing human level performance mm. Uh, just this week at NVIDIA, we announced that we were able to take a model, BERT, with 8 billion parameters and train it in just 53 minutes. Mm. And you can use, you can do inferencing on that model in less than 2 milliseconds. So that has major implications for what you were talking about earlier. When you think of a Is that in the natural language processing or some other Natural domain? language processing. But think of a company interacting with its customers. Mm -hmm. You have customer support, you have call centers. Now you can suddenly provide a more conversational AI experience. So to how that. does that compare to say something like Alexa or Siri or something like Alexa that? Alexa is also Alexa is also a conversational mm -hmm. AI uh, uh, thing, but that's why you compare Alexa with Bert. So yes, yes, but <laughs> Alexa was using earlier model. Bert is a newer model. Uh -huh. So what the point I'm trying to make is just like uh, I said, Amazons of the world adopted it earlier. Right. Now enterprises will be able to adopt it right, right. for things that were more mission critical in nature mm, to them, mm, right? Mm. So that's the second wave. Okay. And the third one that I would say is really on the edge, where if the way you should think about it is, we have spent time training these models. Now you're going to deploy them and many of these deployments will be at the edge. It could be a retail store, trying to make sure my merchandise doesn't get lost and they want to use computer vision to do that. It could be a camera at an intersection. It could be an autonomous vehicle driving on the road. So the edge is really where I, I would say the next wave of adoption would be. Uh, but AI definitely is very transformative to all of these segments. Right. And there will be a lot of domain specific knowledge each one of those uh, scenarios, right? Yes, yes. So how do you get that domain specific knowledge? So the way we get the domain specific knowledge is um, we, we actually staff teams to do that. Mm -hmm. So for each industry at NVIDIA, we have an industry leader mm. who is responsible for having a deep knowledge of that industry and what's happening. We then pair them with other types of team members who are responsible for understanding the ecosystem understanding how we can parallelize that application so that it actually gets accelerated 
And once the acceleration is there, then the value of the GPU for that particular domain is pronounced, right? Mm. So that's how we do it. And uh, you kind of like uh, test it with industry, that specific industry experts, whether the intelligence that you have brought in, whether that uh, measures up to what experts in that scenario. Yes, we engage with Lighthouse customers to do that, just like a startup would, right? Okay. So we work with a few Lighthouse customers, prove out the model, and then go broader from there. Now, it's a little unique in the AI space compared to high performance computing in industries because in AI, there are certain frameworks that are getting standardized. BERT is an example of that, TensorFlow, PyTorch. So, as long as you have accelerated that, you have a big broad base that is already covered, mm. right? So, now it's you're applying incremental knowledge of the industry on top of that. Very interesting. So, now it's a little bit controversial. Yeah. Is um, uh, you are in the data center business. Yes. So, there is some question mark whether uh, enterprise data centers are just going to, you know, <laughs> kind of be a declining sunset market and eventually they are going to disappear. Some of the companies have actually announced that they are going to migrate all their applications to the cloud. So, how do you see that in your business? Yeah, yeah. I will give you my view across all my experiences. So, I. I can just point to the shifts that I see mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, my Yeah, feel free to give a broad brush, I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. sure people would appreciate that. I would say the first, uh, the first big shift that I see is the infrastructure exists to serve the needs of applications, right? Okay. And the application has a certain service level that it expects from the infrastructure. The infrastructure is composed of many things, compute, storage, yep. network and other things. And so the first trend that I see or directionally where I see data centers headed is to be able to take these elements of that infrastructure, compose them in the right way in order to be able to meet that service level objective that okay. is coming from the application. That's right. one trend. Okay. Some, of these, some of these things will, may have conflicting elements, but, mm. but, but that's, that's the first thing I see. The second, uh, the second element is related to what I was talking about, AI. Mm -hmm. And so, if you really look at how software is written today, software today gets written by a software engineer mm -hmm. who is very smart. Mm -hmm. But with the advent of AI, computers are going to write that software using data that they learn from and understand. So, you could envision a world where most of the software is going to be written by a computer and mm -hmm. that computer has to be very smart, it has to, it is to be highly performant. Mm -hmm. But as we discussed earlier, CPU scaling has reached its limit. Uh, so there is only so much you can get out of instruction level parallelism. Now, additional optimizations are going to come from disproportionate increase in power, right? And there is, there is a power envelope that you have to work with. There is a second consideration on this same issue I'm in this high, highly performant environments is that ultimately data movement also becomes a limiting factor, right? True. And locality absolutely matters and you want to minimize the amount of data movement. So while I said earlier that, hey, you want to compose with each individual element, now what I'm saying is the second conflicting element is one of compaction, where you want Just to compact data them together data gravity. And, and bring them as close together and optimize them within the constraints of the power and locality and data movement that you're talking about, right? So you could say that, hey, ideally, I do want to achieve that application's need while serving under this constraint and bringing this together, right? Okay. So that's the second thing I, I see. Uh, and then the third element I would probably point out is the use of AI itself within the infrastructure. When I was at EMC, we were looking to understand how can how can I bring machine learning inside a storage system so I can proactively determine when my system okay. is going to run out of steam? Fair enough. At the scale where data centers are going to operate, traditional management software has to yield its way to automation in AI. Okay. Right? Where on an exception basis you can determine all that, right? So that's really the three directional areas that I think will operate in the data center. You mentioned about cloud. Cloud is absolutely a big influencer, but I think on-prem is here to stay. You will have all three elements, cloud, on-prem, and edge, all mm -hmm. three coexisting. 
Right. But own prem has to transform itself along the lines of what I was talking so about. So one of the elements of that you are saying is the data gravity, where yes. I need, I may need to have uh, applications be close to where. Yes. Yes. Um, so that kind of like uh, brings us to uh, another topic, which you alluded to earlier. You mentioned edge a couple of mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. So, can you elaborate on how uh, you are looking at that whole area of, um, you know, people who are talking about okay, applications are going to the cloud. Yes. Now people are saying no, 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 no. Applications, <laughs> you know, there's going to be the edge. There's going to be the data gravity. Uh, there's IoT. So, how are you looking at the whole uh, area of edge compute and what are your thoughts on where are the opportunities for mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to do infrastructure infrastructure level innovation? In mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, first of all, one philosophy you could take is you're going to develop on premise, test in the cloud, and deploy on the edge. Right okay. now, it's not mutually exclusive, but it's a simple way for you to think about it. And I know from my past discussions, you've been, when you were looking at hybrid cloud, you looked at kind of how can my workload be seamlessly mm -hmm. between the cloud and on-premise. There is a similar thing that extends to the edge as well, which means that the commonality of that software, the software stack, and how seamlessly you can manage it across these three elements becomes a very important aspect. Mm -hmm. We talked about this composability element earlier. You want to have a good experience at the edge as well. At the edge also, you don't want to just have a general purpose server. You want a managed appliance with, with, with the okay. right kind of software on it. So with these kind of things in mind at NVIDIA, at Computex earlier this year, we announced uh, a new platform called EGX. I see. EGX is our accelerated computing platform for low latency and high throughput AI at the edge. I see. Uh, so the idea is you should be able to, again, develop your models on-premise, test them in the cloud, deploy it at the edge as needed. Now, uh, but at the edge, it's also important to have the right software stack that can achieve that commonality, yep. including for the particular vertical that, mm. that you care about. So the way we do that is we actually have a central repository called NGC, NVIDIA GPU Cloud. I see. Where you build a software stack and you containerize it, and then you can download that your, your registered mm -hmm. stack mm -hmm. into wherever you want, including the edge. And so that's kind of how we are approaching the edge. There's a lot of uh, uh, work that still needs to go happen on the edge side for us. But that's how we are, that's how we are looking. How at are the you edge. viewing service providers? Five G. How does that play into this? Five G would be a good it would be a big user of the edge. I would say right. So if you think about base stations and mm -hmm. what telcos want to do at the at the edge, they are they are AR VR services they want to provide at the edge. They may want to provide translation services. So with five G, suddenly what you find is you are able to. Uh, the round trip latency is very, very low. Very short. And that opens up a big, big market. And so all, all I am saying with EGX is that we are giving you the right kind of platform to go do that. We have actually partnered with Red Hat OpenShift mm -hmm. because they have the right orchestration layer with OpenShift mm -hmm. to provide that experience for the, for the deployment of that software stack. I see. And you are working with service providers on the... Because they seem to be investing heavily yeah. into that area and uh, I don't know whether you are... By service providers, you mean... Like a Verizon, like... Yes, a, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The major... Uh, there is Telcos. The major telecommunication providers, we are engaged with them. Yes. You are engaged with yes. them. Okay. Are there like trials going on with your EGX? And I can't comment on that. That's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Secret. Okay. So, uh, kind of like a slightly shifting track. Um, so one of the uh, sensitive areas, whether it comes to uh, on-premise computing or cloud or now edge, is security. So what's your, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on uh, cloud, edge, IoT, all of these, the security aspects of these things? So Prabhakar, let me first of all say that I am not an expert on security, but I'll share with you my thoughts to the best I can. 
So first of all, I think there is a fundamental difference between cloud data centers and the edge, right? So when you are at cloud or in a data center, you're dealing with a multi-tenant environment. You, have, yep. you may have thousands of users. Right. So you fundamentally have to assume that one user is hostile to the other one. And you well, at least they want to be isolated. Yes, yeah. and so you have to be able to design security with that in mind. Now, Edge is a little different where it's more likely a single tenant environment, but there is threat there too. The kind of threats at the edge could be that somebody may come steal all your data or they may fool you into running a container or an image that you did not intend to run, right? So, uh, for example, uh, when I talked about a central repository where we maintain our images, we want those images to run on the intended node, mm. not some certified, certified, right, certified, certified thing, right? So with that in mind, I would say there are three things from a security standpoint that, uh, that I would like to emphasize. First is, you want to secure all data at rest and in transit. Okay. Right? So if you have a central repository of images, you secure them, mm. encrypt them, but as they are going, making their way to the edge, in transit also they need to be secured. The second thing is, each image, you want to make sure that it's properly signed so that when it's being run on a particular node, you know that this is the intended node where mm -hmm. it was supposed to be run. Or this if it's being run by a trusted computer. Yeah, it's a trusted mm -hmm. element. And then you want secure boot type capabilities also, where as you bring up that entire application stack on the node, every element of that stack you want to make sure is, is a trusted one and is properly signed for, right? So when the firmware comes up and the OS comes up, each thing needs to have a, have a chain of trust mm -hmm. on the basis of which it's coming up, right? So those are uh, some of my thoughts. So I, yeah, got... it's interesting, right? Uh, when it comes to uh, enterprise data center or the cloud, um, they are highly controlled environments, but some of the edge environment may not be. Correct. They may be kind of like in an IoT, rugged Correct. deployment, or it could be in a telco closet, or it could be in a uh, uh, micro data center. Um, so, uh, are there things that uh, are being done uh, to specifically secure those type of not so well controlled environments? That's kind of what I was hinting at that because they are some like sitting say some farther away from you, you are, you are basing the trust on something else in the data center, for example, right? So you had this repository of images mm -hmm. and you have signed them in a certain way. You are enforcing that trust in a certain way. When components are coming up in the node, you are making sure they're all trusted components, right? So that's how you are enforcing it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep, yep, makes sense, makes sense. But you also, you may have to have uh, some security in the hardware itself. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. You can, okay. you, the, the chain of trust that I was talking about, you can implement part of that in the silicon itself. So, you, um, so NVIDIA also taking some steps in that direction. Again, I can't comment on that. <laughs> More secrets. <laughs> so, uh, shifting uh, gears again, so I know that uh, in addition to the data center business itself, you are uh, driving something called the Accelerated Data Science Platform. platform yes. I know that you talked about platform in general yes. for different verticals. Is this the same thing or is it something slightly different? How do, how do people work with this and what are the specialities yeah. of this? It's a different platform, let, let me explain. So the GPU architecture is one. And NVIDIA started by accelerating graphics workloads, then HPC workloads, then deep learning workloads. So with this data science platform, now we accelerate machine learn, traditional machine learning workloads. Mm -hmm. So let's say, first of all, machine learning is everywhere. If you go to Netflix, 80% uh, of the movies recommendations are based on machine learning. Mm -hmm. If you're making Amazon purchases, one third of them are based on machine learning. But the, there is a challenge that data scientists face when they are training their models, which is the, the whole workflow of machine learning can be slow. And, and the slowness is primarily in the data preparation stage, also in the, in the training stage. And uh, that's because they're running on slow CPU-based infrastructures. Mm -hmm. and, and they might be using hundreds or thousands of nodes. 
So what we decided to do was to say, let's bring this entire workflow inside a GPU and accelerate it and deliver 50x, 100x speed ups on that whole workflow. That's what the data science platform mm. does. The way we do that is through three software libraries. Mm. The first one will make sure that the loading of the data itself into GPU memory is accelerated. Mm -hmm. Then the okay. second, second library will make sure that typical algorithms, XGBoost, Random Forest, Scikit-Learn, those things are accelerated. Like that, that okay. remember I was taking it's all application specific, right. so you right. have to make sure. So you sure extracted specific algorithms from this each space. Yes, right. yeah, to okay. make sure that they're accelerated. Okay. And finally, things like graph analytics and visualization is accelerated. Mm -hmm. so that begins to give you that complete workflow. And for customers, that can be very transformative. I'll take an example of a retailer who has 5,000 stores, 100,000 SKUs in each store. They now do replenishment on a weekly basis. They want to get to a weekly uh, or a daily replenishment. But they cannot do that today with their existing work. But when they went to GPUs, they were able to reduce the number of nodes from hundreds, hundreds of nodes to like tens of nodes and get to a daily replenishment rate. Mm. Right? So, and by doing it faster, you can improve the accuracy of your models as well. I see. So basically think of NVIDIA as for each category, deep learning, uh, we have accelerated things like TensorFlow, PyTorch. Here we are mm. accelerating traditional machine learning library. Okay. In the area of high performance computing, we might be accelerating some uh, molecular biology application. Mm -hmm. But in the case of graphics, we may be accelerating a rendering application. Right. Right? So in each area, we have to do some specific work to make sure it's working on the GPU with the right level of performance and acceleration. And this data this science platform assures that for for machine learning for machine learning for specifically machine learning. yeah yes okay so i think uh, we have covered uh, various uh, different topics from my industry perspective nvidia perspective so kind of uh, coming a little closer to home here uh -huh. so um, uh, fabric uh, very closely collaborates with entrepreneurs to identify opportunities in the infrastructure space and we co-create the companies with them so, um, do you have any uh, kind of views, suggestions on our approach, how yeah. we can uh, improve, how we can uh, do more, better? First of all, I know Fabric mostly through my interactions with you and uh, through entrepreneurs like Dhawal who is at IOTM. Yeah. But I'll share with you my impressions based on my learnings through those interactions. Uh, first, I, I am quite impressed with the fact that you have chosen to focus on the infrastructure space and within that you have narrowed down to saying, hey, I want to focus on cloud or the edge. So by doing that shows like clarity of your mind that, hey, these are the places where we can add value and nurture companies, right? Because strategy is all about focus and, and, and driving that focus. That's, that's the first thing that stands out for me. Second, whenever I've spoken to you, I've been very impressed with your knowledge of specifically, I would say, hybrid cloud Thank and you. edge and security <laughs> and those things. So I feel that for entrepreneurs to be able to work with somebody who actually doesn't just understand the business, but understands the technology directions of where things are headed and not just understand, but have built and kind of had successful exits, that's powerful, I think. So that's, that's the second thing that we will stands quote out you on me. that. You can. <laughs> but the third thing that comes to my mind is your co-creation concept, right? When I think of it, traditional VC, an entrepreneur goes to them, asks for money, they invest. In your case, my impression is you are first and foremost proactively thinking about what are the kind of companies you want to go build, given your understanding of the space. Then you are looking for entrepreneurs yes. who are thinking similarly, and then a technology is just technology, ideas are just ideas. You actually have to then go build a company that can stand on its own hand in hand, right? So I think being able to do that and have that shared mutual interest is, is a very powerful thing that you guys are doing. Uh, in my view. Thank you for those comments. And uh, if you know of good entrepreneurs, please uh, send them our way always. I will, I will. So kind of like uh, to wrap things up, uh, generalizing from the fabric perspective to the general entrepreneurial audience out there. You have been an entrepreneur yourself multiple uh, times. 
So, and also you are now at NVIDIA and I am sure you are uh, looking at companies that want to come in and do things with NVIDIA. So, what are your, what is your, uh, you know, parting words or wisdom to entrepreneurs on some do's and don'ts, don'ts mm -hmm. especially when it comes to say working with larger companies, mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? I will share three pieces of advice, I uh, will start with NVIDIA itself. Um, see first the world of, we, or first I was used to a world of ISVs, we used to build applications. That world is changing now to a world of cloud services, right? Every single human activity ultimately manifests now as a cloud service that you may experience through an app. But who is driving all that innovation? It's coming from startups mm -hmm. and at NVIDIA, we put a lot of emphasis on that, that that's where the world is headed and that ecosystem of startups is something that we need to stay engaged with. So we have an inception program where uh, we have north of 4,000 startups in that program today. So my first piece of advice is uh, take pride in what you do, but check out our inception <laughs> program, right? Excellent. It's important for NVIDIA as well. Okay. Uh, my second piece of advice, which uh, we touched in in the fabrics context as well, is see, just the technology by itself is not going to take you to where you want to mm -hmm. be. Uh, the secret sauce is in all in building the right team and getting the go to market right. And I'll right. touch on the go to market portion, which is try to solve a customer problem all the way. Like, pick a customer problem, but then Figure out what ecosystem do you need to work with, what services partners do you need to work with because from the customer standpoint they want a whole solution. Mm -hmm. You may be solving a piece of it but you have to think about how the whole thing comes together to right. solve that one slice that you have identified that you are going to solve and solve okay. it all the way. And then the third piece of advice I have is about rigorous prioritization which is again something I talked in a fabrics context. Because strategy, in my opinion, is all about what you are not going to do as mm -hmm. much it's about what you are going to do. And so the rigorous prioritization gives you clarity of vision. But it's also important for you to have the right KPIs and early indicators of success. So once you prioritize, figure out how you are going to measure your early success. And then if that measurement tells you that things are off in any way, like you adapt. But at least you are clear about what game you are playing and why and what the KPIs associated with that are, right? So those are my, my three, three pieces of advice. Uh, excellent advice. I hope the audience uh, takes that into uh, mind. So thanks for coming and sharing your thoughts you. with us. And uh, uh, until the next episode of Spotlight, we'll say bye. Thank you. Thanks, Prabhupada.